Hello and welcome to Crossroads Cafe. I'm your host, Eden, and I'm so honored to have Heather Christian on the show today. Heather is the writer and star of Animal Wisdom, a musical that is also a seance that she sometimes describes as a requiem mass. In the show, Christian, who comes from a long line of migraine-suffering musicians and mediums, introduces us to many of the ghosts she's met throughout her life. Threading religion, folklore, blues, rock and roll, Coca-Cola communions, quantum physics, and so much more into the mix. The show, which is now available as a film, is a truly transformative experience that you kind of have to witness yourself to understand. And Christian and her band's immense talent and deep sensitivity makes it all the more extraordinary to experience. With all that said, I'm so excited to have Heather Christian here. Enjoy the show. Okay, um, thank you so much for being here and doing this interview. Your show, Animal Wisdom, is truly one of the more creative um, and mind-expanding things I've seen in quite a long time, so oh, congratulations awesome. on that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'd love it if you could just start by maybe describing the show for anyone listening. Um, I tried to explain what it was to a few people, and it's such a dynamic project, so I was just curious about how you have been describing it to people. I've I've moved around. I've I've said a lot of things. I think what I'm saying now recently is that uh, it is a um a, a sort of concert slash theater film piece um that is set to a very specific task um of ritualizing um a community release with the grief that we are holding um and making a ritual space out of your living room. That's kind of what I'm calling it. Um, this is the problem when you try to, to bend uh, genres is that <laughs> you no longer have a succinct sound bite um, to give people in order to try to describe what it is that you're doing. Um, but it's I, I would call it an interactive concert ritual. Let's, let's start there. Yeah, very cool. Um, I mean, I try to interview artists who work at the intersections of different fields and uh, things for this podcast so this is really perfect because it was just so many different mediums you have musical theater and interactive conversation and all these different things um so yeah it's very creative um how did you first come up with the idea for the show um well the show originally was a live theater piece um and i uh originally started writing it as um an exercise to um to expel some of my own demons i think i thought that i had to i grew up um my 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 whole family is a line of devout catholics and there's something and i worked for the catholic church from the age of like 11 um and so i am sort of i've been entrenched since a very young age in the theater of the catholic church um, and there's something that I like in these old rituals in that they decide that they're going to like go about doing a thing at a very specific time in a very specific place. And they're going to say that they're going to do the thing and then they do the thing and then they say that it worked. And that felt like a good way to go about an exorcism of my own. <laughs> so I set to writing myself a requiem to release whatever it was that um, I thought at the time was uh, strangling me. Um, and then, uh, as I, in the last year of the piece, um, I decided, um, I, I decided it was a requiem. In fact, that was, that wasn't language until I had, that I had until the last like year of writing it. Um, and, um, so I constructed it to the EKG of a requiem mass rather than um, a strict, like a, a, a normal narrative structure that plays are usually constructed around. And then I decided to stuff a textually adapted requiem in the middle of it. Um, and all of a sudden it became very clear that this wasn't just, that I didn't want to just exercise my own demons. That seems like a narcissistic effort. But what I did want to do was show my hand enough to, so that people could find some commonality with whatever it is that they are carrying and then give them the space with music without a lot of um, visual saturation, or in fact, no visual saturation, <laughs> um, so that they could go internal 
um, and try to let something go themselves. Um, and that was that was that was that was the hope. And then um, then the pandemic happened. Um, and uh, what was supposed to be an American tour of the live theater show um, turned into a well, what if we stream it? And since it was a piece that was so much about the place that it happens, um, I decided that in order to do it effectually, we would have to adapt it into a screenplay in order to ritualize the space that it is being watched in, which is the living room, which is a stranger's living room. Um, so that's how this film adaptation started. And, um, and here we are. <laughs> here we are. Yeah, well, it's, it's an incredibly dynamic and ambitious pro- project. Um, and yeah, I'd love to... Um, the, the Requiem portion where the viewer closes their eyes um, was a really stunning, stunning part of the show that I feel like I'm going to have to go back and listen to. And even then, I don't know if I would understand it. It felt like kind of like this very surreal, like transcendent poetry. So I'm just really curious about how you went about writing that and uh, yeah, how how you shaped it because you said it was sort of based on an actual Requiem yeah. mass, right? Yeah, so I, what I did was I went back to the original Latin of um, a traditional Requiem Mass. And lots of people have written Requiem Masses, um, including Mozart. Mozart, Mozart's killed him, or at least that's what he felt. (laughs) He felt that his Requiem killed him. Um, But it's all based around um, the same texts. Um, And that text is originally written in Latin. So I went back to the original Latin. I knew a little bit of ecclesiastical Latin enough to sort of glean um, in a very, like you said, surreal way um, what was going on um, uh, within the text without having, without the traditional English translations in front of me. Um, And I took that and I, I would e- I wouldn't even call it an adaptation. I feel like I kind of cannibalized it um, because because of my rudimentary understanding of the Latin. Really, what I'm what I'm seeing is verbs and nouns. <laughs> like I'm seeing verbs and nouns, and so it reads as sort of like a um, a codex of fence posts of like all right, we're talking about like the pages of God. We're talking about the finger. We're talking about the 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 body as like a flesh book or we're talking about um you know stepping upward ascension um so it's it became like a loose frame um for me to hang my own flowery um language on and since the piece is also sort of rooted in the south i really thought about the southern poets that I have been um, inspired by my whole life and I, I mean I call William Faulkner a southern poet because I think he writes like a poet um, but the there's something in um, specifically southern poetic language where the metaphor is so stark it's almost naked it's a it's a really powerful gesture that's not particularly flowery, it's aggressive. There's like aggressive poetic language and I really gravitated towards that. So um, I was trying to do something similar with how um, it wanted to come out of the mouth Um, while following this rubric of, okay, now we're talking about lambs. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) now we're talking about locusts, Um, yeah. So that's kind of it. It was sort of um, something that I wrote with part of my unconscious mind it felt like um like dream fabric and i think that that's part of why it works is because it's not um you know it's not concrete enough story-wise to exclude anyone from its story it can sort of shape shift um and morph with um you know whatever anyone else is carrying mm-hmm. yeah that's um, such an incredible undertaking and um i definitely yeah, I got the feeling that a lot of the lyrics especially seemed sort of channeled. So I guess I wanted to ask you about that. Um, how, because you, so many of the lyrics are just so um, unbelievably creative and yet yeah, surreal and dreamlike. So yeah. do you feel like you kind of channel those? Do they just sort of pour out of you or do you kind of, like, how do you, how do well, those lyrics come to you? A little column A, a little column B. Um, specifically in regard to the Requiem, um, a lot of it was 
just just work like my editor went to work um a lot of the beginning like the dsc era uh, at the beginning of the requiem and the kyrie all of that is <clears throat> is i feel like me riffing and me trying to do something very intentionally it didn't necessarily feel like a channel it felt like i was setting an intention but when you get to the end like the imparadisum that's the closest thing to a channel that i feel like i've ever experienced in my life i actually I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how to finish writing the Requiem. So I bought myself, um, a one-way plane ticket to Rome, uh, <laughs> the summer before, um, I was supposed to do a workshop of the thing, um, to sit in catacombs and, um, just sort of absorb the, not just the history, but the age of the place, um, and Rome is like, you know, whatever. The Catholicism in Rome is, there's there's a massive history there that I don't feel the roots of here in this country. So I kind of wanted to go and see if it would inspire anything in me. Um, and I, you know, I, I walked around, I went to catacombs, I visited a bunch of tombs. Um, I had a weird experience with um, St. Rita and St. Agnes. <laughs> um in their respective chapels and um and then I got really lost I had this one awful day where I got really lost and my phone didn't work and I was I wasn't feeling particularly inspired and I was sort of feeling sorry for myself because I had spent all this money to go to Rome to do a thing and I'm all I was doing was making trash um and a rainstorm started sporadically and I got caught in it and didn't have an umbrella, didn't know where I was. And there was a traffic median that happened to also be an olive grove. There was this olive grove, like in the middle of a highway. Um, so I went into this olive grove and I sat underneath a tree while it was raining and cried. And then when it stopped, I got delivered the finale to to this piece and there's no other way to put that I just feel like it was delivered I had a little recorder with me and I just sang it through um and there's a couple pieces in in, in animal wisdom that are like that but that was the most aggressively like this is something that fell from the ceiling <laughs> I don't feel like I wrote it at all um and you know I feel like we all have that right we all have that as makers as, and as artists and that's always what we're chasing but you have to kind of do the other side of it. You have to do the like, oh, I'm going to be an editor. Oh, this is an intellectual exercise. Oh, this is the work of pipe cleaning and diligence in order to be primed for that ceiling thing to happen. So I think it's all the same thing. It's all the same process, at least to me. Yeah, totally. Um, that's such a gorgeous image. And yeah, I, I mean, I write as well. And I definitely have had experiences where things will just come fully formed, like they'll just show up. And I know a lot of, yeah, a lot of creators yeah. have that. And it definitely speaks to the fact that, yeah, either our subconscious mind or like our collective unconscious or something is writing out there. Yes. I don't know. What do you, what do you yeah. think it is? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what it, I mean, that's also like part of the question of this piece is like, am I a playwright or am I a medium? <laughs> I don't know where, <laughs> I don't know where you draw the line. Um, honestly, mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know, like, what, what, which of the songs that, like, the, the music that I just hear in the ether, I don't know if it's because I have a brain tumor, or if it's because, mm -hmm. you know, something's talking to me, or if I just have a wild imagination, and I don't think it really matters, um, mm -hmm. as long as we're, like, keeping curiosity and wonder alive for ourselves enough to keep writing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely, yeah, and I think that, uh, I'm thinking now of the line, you have this really incredible sequence in the show um, where you talk about like playing the soul as the fifth and I think like psychology as the one yeah. and you have like these different elements as different instruments and at one point you talk about sort of how music is a thread between all these things and between the worlds and yeah. I would just love to hear more about the process of writing that and um, where you see music fitting in in the middle of all of that, if, if that question makes sense. <laughs> totally. I mean, I feel, I feel like that that song um, feels really oddly, even though it it's I call it a treatise, 
<laughs> I do call it a treatise. I call it something very sterile. Um, feel, feels personal, actually. Um, that song to me is, uh, is about how I personally feel like I make sense of the world without going nuts. Um, music can hold so much complexity um, and counterpoint without being cacophonous. Um, and that's a kind of dance that I'm trying to like superimpose on the rest of my life that feels like there's so many conflicting ideas and um, complex truths that, that we have to hold at once um, in this life. And I don't know that I believe in subjective truth with a capital T, um, at least on a human scale, right? Um, I don't know that, I think that there are, surely there are facts that have parameters, but like the truth is squidgy. Um, so like an illustration of something that is not necessarily true, but something that is complex and conflicting and is, is something that music can do, um, that you can't necessarily just do with spoken word and explanation. Um, I think you can also get at it with dance. Um, I'm not a dancer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a choreographer. Uh, music is my medium. Um, so I feel like, but all the tools kind of lie there, right? Like um, you can fit anything inside anything else, no matter how disparate it is. It can all remain in the same song and at the same vibration. Um, if you have the patience to, um, to, to make it work right to and making it work is just having the diligence of imagination to figure out how they speak to each other um and i feel like that's just a an overarching gesture of how i'm trying to live <laughs> and not be nuts um is how to, how do i contextual how do i find a container for all of the conflicting information um that makes it all sound like it belongs yeah um it's like you're trying to kind of write your life into a song in a way yeah um yeah that's that's um that's really cool and yeah i mean it reminds me and i'm sure you know about like the music of the spheres idea and how like there's theories that our universe was just created by sound and vibration um and i always think that's really powerful um just like music brings us to this much older place and yeah um yeah there was one line of yours that was uh i wish i remembered exactly what it is but it said something about how music is connected to human evolution and like maybe you said like, consciousness or something like that and i just was curious about yeah like how do you feel like music and, and human evolution are connected oh i mean i feel like everything's connected i feel like you what i what i what i say in the thing is that it's a it's impossible to talk about um, it's impossible to talk about God without talking about human nature and evolution and it's impossible to talk about those things without talking about music mm -hmm. um, I just I feel like we right there's there's history and then there's prehistory there's like what we know about um, the first people of our species <laughs> and mm -hmm. then there's what we don't know but what we do know is that sort of as long as we've been around we've been making noise um mm -hmm. so it does feel and you know, we've we've evolved into creatures that have decided to use noise as the way to communicate the primary way to communicate um so sound i feel like is integral to um to how we express mm -hmm. um i don't I feel like, and it's something that we forget about because we use, we use our voices in such a pedestrian and vulgar way every day um, mm -hmm. that it's something that we as a species have chosen to beatify and like make a big deal out of. Like this is the thing we're going to get virtuosic at, vibrate in our vocal cords. <laughs> we're going to get real good at that. Like that was a thing that happened and not all animals did that. Um, so I feel like it's, specifically with singing um that it's ancient um and it's something really uh 
human, right? Like it's something that's very basically human. Um, and I, I dig that. I dig that about music. Um, it feels mm-hmm. it feels a lot more like uh, primal, um, more at like the root of being the specific kind of animal that I am uh, mm-hmm. to use noise as a means to try to express, even if I'm trying to do that abstractly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. And I always think of music as a way to yeah, say or say things that can't be said or a way to um, form a connection when there isn't one. Um, and I also think it's very cool how music always appears in conjunction with religion or worship. Um, like growing up, I would always, you know, I didn't really like, um, I went to Hebrew school and Bible school and I didn't really like <laughs> learning about any of it, but I really love the music always. Yeah. Um, and that's just always been like the, that's been religion to me, like the strongest part of religion. I don't know if you had a similar yeah, same. feeling growing up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I started working for the church as a cantor and I know that, uh, cantors in the Catholic church are slightly different. Um, but, uh, in that we, you know, we're not ordained. You can just, you know, be a cantor if you if you can keep a tune. Um, and then eventually started taking jobs as a music director. So I was always involved in the church, uh, the church's like music scene. Um, and yeah, similar, it's similar. Like that's sort of where I found the, you know, everything sort of starts to feel real. Everything starts to feel, um, convincing in a religious setting when music is around, um, I think there's a reason for that. I I think that music is probably the most aggressive dramaturgical tool out there. Um, it's it's pretty it's pretty violent <laughs> what you can do to people <laughs> with a piece of music. Yeah. So it would make sense to use it in a religious setting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you are just an incredible musician. I was really impressed by the yeah your vocal range. Oh, I'm thanks. sure you get that a lot. <laughs> 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 Yeah, were you, were you, I guess you assume you started singing at a young age and kind of were always doing that? Yeah, I, um, my, my grandma was a singer and, um, my mom, my mom likes to say that I, you know, I was singing before I could speak. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've been, my mom also says that I crawled up on a piano bench when I was three years old and was picking out the jingles from the commercials on the on the keys so I was I was put into lessons pretty quickly um when I was a kid so I uh I um I I don't really remember a time before music actually um it's kind of always been around and always been a part of me it's always been playing in the house like my parents listen to music while they're doing everything um and so it's always it's always been a major part major part of my life yeah, I mean, it's clear. Um, I just, I was so impressed by how you shapeshift throughout the show. Like, you'd be, um, the, like, when you shapeshifted into sort of, like, that rock star form, and then you kind of do the priestess, and then you then you have this very, like, conversational um, self outside of the music. It's, it's very cool. Um, how does it feel, like, making those shifts throughout the show? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's... When doing it for the film, it's different because you have time in between those shifts to sort of like, you know, really get into and out of (laughs) those head spaces. When doing it in the context of the show, it's exhausting. Um, It's exhausting to to flip between all of those different spaces in, in an evening. But those are not like they don't feel I don't know. They they don't feel like they're any of these things are not particularly far removed from me like they all sort of came out of me so I don't feel like I'm putting on anything that's external um it's stuff that was already inside that I'm that I'm excavating or making a hyperbole out of so I don't think it's the same kind of um fatigue that maybe a character actor has when they're really like stretching for um a character that they don't have a whole lot in common with um but you know having said that like most of the personalities and ghosts that are, that I step in to channel, I like that you use that word, so I'm going to use it too. (laughs) Um, The things that I step into channel, um, 
some of them are not peaceful places that I like to be in. Some of them are not peaceful spirits that I like to visit for particularly long periods of time. I think that it's important for me to get them out. Um, specifically with like the rock star persona, I was interested in bringing that energy in because of, because that's, um, and I don't know if this reads at all, and I don't know that it's even important, but I feel like so many of us, um, glorify, um, the self-destructiveness of like a tortured artist, of, um, somebody who has demons and who has darkness and that's what it looks like, like a self-destructive, like cavalier. I'm going to use all of my energy. I'm going to use all of, um, you know, my sexuality and my, pro like all of the, the big shit that I've got. I'm going to put it on the plate for your consumption. I feel like that's destructive. Um, that's not something that I do regularly as a performer. And I feel like that's also, it's part of the point is to bring that out and show it and show that there's a cost. There's a cost to um, that kind of attitude. There's a cost to uh, to owning and identifying with and like idolizing a rock star darkness that lies in all of us. Um, you know, you have to cut it with some light um, in order to just be a person and get through the day, I think. Um, and my uncle RL, I think is where I get that destructive streak. Um, there's a history of schizophrenia in my, in my family. And, um, you know, he's, he was the, he was the most far gone case. And, you know, it's true that on my worst days, I, you know, I don't give a damn about myself. And some people think that's hot <laughs> and maybe that's a problem. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's interesting to know the context that you kind of chose to, yeah, chose to embody that destructiveness, but like in a very contained way. Because, um, yeah, certainly, like I've been thinking a lot about and talking a lot about, you know, the importance of embracing the shadow and things like that. But I guess when you let the shadow overtake everything else, then that's also imbalanced. Um, yeah. Well, I think like also you like you have to have strict boundaries with the shadow. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I, I agree with you that, that, that acknowledging and, um, looking into the shadow was absolutely necessary to know yourself. Um, but you know, you can't give them the keys to the car, uh, mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's definitely an ongoing, um, balance and yeah, I mean, I know that you, in the beginning of the show, you kind of said that um, there was like maybe some danger, maybe more that you were more afraid of. Um, how do you sort of work to keep yourself safe through the show or um, sort of how do you manage to hold hold that fear? Ooh, um, well, when we originally did it as a theater performance, um, I was currently going through what I had uh, then termed as career ending performance anxiety. So while I was writing the show, um, I knew that I was a person who was actively trying to, um, to heal myself during it. So I wrote a bunch of little fixes and band-aids into the piece. And some of them happened in the film and some of them didn't. Um, like there's moments where, you know, after a certain piece, I know I get really nauseous. And so there's, I made sure that it was in my blocking to go make myself a ginger tea. Um, and I had a speaking part that was long enough to, um, so that I could drink it, <laughs> get it in my system. Or there was a moment where I wanted to like leave, um, the stage every night. And so I just wrote it into the script that if I needed to pull the trigger, I could. And, um, I would just tell the band that I needed to stop. Um, and then we would huddle and, um, you know, love on each other for a couple minutes, um, before we resumed. There's just like little things like, I, I, and in, in doing the film, like it's, it's a little different because, you know, when you, when you do a film, you can't leave. Like if, if I leave, the camera follows me. So it's more like, how do I, 
how do we maintain this conversation of I can't, I'm not allowed to escape. I have to get through it without, um, without physically leaving the space. Um, and, um, that turned into that again, I bring it up because that becomes a conversation about safety. So it's, I had a long conversation with my DP (laughs) of, uh, you know, like things might get a little intense for me and I might need to, to step out and, um, you know, uh, before, before we shoot, I sort of baptized the piano in Palo Santo and, um, you know, I make sure that I'm well fed, um, that I get a bunch of sleep and I make sure to be, um, I'm not, I'm not the kind of person that ever wants to stop. You know, I'm not the kind of person that ever wants to say I have to take a break. I'm sort of the last person on earth that would want a room to take a break if I needed a break. So I had to be very vigilant with myself. (laughs) Be like, girl, take a break. (laughs) I need, I need to go walk around the block um, and shake it off. Um, And luckily the kind of room that we made was a room wherein we could do that. Anybody could raise their hand and say they needed to do that because it's intense material and we were all coming out of a pandemic. Um, So we were, I think it's important to establish the kind of room where everyone respects and cares for each other enough to where that's the scenario, um, mm-hmm. you know, where you can raise your hand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, I think you could kind of feel the, um, like sort of the love between you and the band was very visible throughout the show and the support that was there, um, mm-hmm. I felt. And so, yeah, but I think also that sort of seems like good a good life lesson, like um, building in breaks for yourself, <laughs> keeping yourself nourished as you try to do this really in-depth work. Um, feels yeah feels like uh, very important so um yeah I would love to hear about the um the band because they were really extraordinary um how did you find all of them did you know them before oh they are extraordinary individuals and they all came from different places um I so Sasha my uh guitarist Sasha Brown um I've known for 20 years he's been he was one of the first members of my band um the Arbonauts and uh, he's just one of my best friends and just happens to be the most virtuosic badass <laughs> musician that I know. So I, I'm, I'm always trying to rope Sasha into my projects, but I also wanted to rope Sasha into this project because I knew that he actually cares about me. Like he actually knows me. He sees me. He cares about me. I need to have some family in the room. Um, Maya Sharp, uh, the violinist and vocalist, extraordinary human like she's she does so much she's like a she's also a photographer she does this visual art thing she's um a singer she's a violinist she's an actor she's she does so much um I had known her about her but I'd never met her um and she was the last person that I cast because I thought I was going to cast someone else and at the last minute like a week before rehearsal started she pulled out and I needed somebody very quickly And Maya was a friend of a friend and she came into the room for one day and I was like, holy cow, (laughs) you're perfect. (laughs) And God sent you. Um, And she is, she's just like a a walking beam of light. Um, Thank God she was there. Um, She just turns every situation, she like throws a pink light around every situation. She's amazing. Um, Eric Farber is a uh, percussionist and percussion designer who I had been a fan of um, for a couple of years. Um, I had seen some pieces that he had worked in, and um, Eric has a very specific relationship with objects. And I just thought it would, like, how cool would it be if all of the, because I'm, I'm a pretty, like, figurative language heavy writer. Um, if all of the metaphors that I'm talking about could manifest themselves in physical space and we could make music out of those things, wouldn't that be amazing? Um, so I took that to Eric and he was like, oh yeah. Um, and Eric and I sort of started our relationship with this piece. Um, and he, you know, he clearly brings so much of himself to everything that he brings to the piece. Um, B.E. Farrell. Um, it was our bassist, uh, BE, I actually just met on this film, um, because our original bassist, 
um, Fred is, uh, was, had moved away, um, and had just taken a new job and couldn't, uh, sadly couldn't do the process. So, uh, Fred is with us in spirit and in voice <laughs> on the soundtrack. Uh, but B, we had just met and it, again, just like I've got a guardian angel watching out for me, B.E. showed up and was perfect. Um, and had this like incredibly grounding, grounded, um, an inquisitive nature about him just like played the crap out of everything as a gorgeous open soul. Um, super curious and super down for everything that the piece was doing and just like instantly became part of the family. But yes, they're all badasses and I am an incredibly fortunate human <laughs> um, to know them and get to work with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they really seemed like uh, they were so in flow with the piece and um, yeah, it was just like you were sort of at the center, but then there was this very sort of supportive circle um, which I think made it even more powerful to watch. Yeah, um, well, it wouldn't be possible without them. Like, I, mm -hmm. I don't know that, and I for I one hundred percent know that I could not have done that piece alone on a stage, even if I like mm -hmm. pitted an orchestra. Like, you need a community to, to, in order to do something that's authentically of yourself, you know. And I was trying mm -hmm. to do something that really did blur the line between what is narrative and what is my reality. Um, from mm -hmm. night to night like I was trying to do something real um, mm -hmm. and I don't think that that's possible unless you have um, unless you have people who are helping you and you know making you stronger you know people who mm -hmm. are smarter than you to help you <laughs> <laughs> um, get your own words out of your mouth, own mouth yeah I mean you definitely you can't create alone um, for sure I think that's a big pandemic um, takeaway for me. Um, yeah, um, I'm interested in that thing that you said um, that blurs the line between narrative and reality. Um, how did you feel like you tried to do that? Well, I, n I wanted to do it, I wanted to subvert this idea of, um, I mean, I'm always trying to subvert the idea of musical theater in general, uh -huh. but I also wanted to like subvert this idea of performance. There's something, there's like some tricky uh, middle ground. Like when you go to a concert, um, you just sort of accept that whoever is singing you the song wrote that song about their life um, mm -hmm. and that they have a different relation to it, rela relationship to it now while they're singing it to you than they did when they wrote it. Um, and so you have this sort of like dance between like, oh, what happened to them? And oh, but how are they now? Um, so I, and I think that that's an interesting relationship. Like when you see a concert, we all agree that we are living here and now, and we've brought our, mm -hmm. our authentic selves to the thing. And as a result, like you, I feel like there are, people are a little bit more open to receiving something unexpected. Whereas like in the theater, it's usually like people know that they're, they're attending a well-made machine. Um, and so the audience feels a little reflective. Like you put, you put your energy out there and you can almost feel it like ricochet back to you. Um, and I didn't want that. I wanted, I wanted to make something that was a little bit, that encouraged a little bit more suppleness from an audience so that they mm -hmm. could like find their way inside of it. And the way I decided mm -hmm. to do that, because this is a piece of musical theater, is to sort of start out like ch ticking all of those boxes and filling the expectations of like, okay, we're going to sing and dance. It's a musical mm -hmm. theater show, y'all. Here's some underscore. We know how to get behind this. Um, I'm going to talk at you really cheeky. I'm going to make a bunch of jokes. I'm going to present like I'm some, you know, bonkers southern woman cabaret MC. Mm -hmm. People know how to take that. Um, and then bit by bit, I wanted to just start taking things away. So I wanted to start mm -hmm. taking away um, like uh, lyrics that, that were um, highly explanatory. I wanted to start taking mm -hmm. away uh, like typical underscore structure and, um, and uh, patter. Uh, and then I wanted to start slowly taking away trust of the narrator um, and strip away any of the like hyperbole that I was putting on top of the performance of myself 
um, so that when we arrive at um, at the sort of last act of the show, I am 100% myself, my real self, as broken and <laughs> uh, mm. uh, nervous and um, conflicted as I am. But I think that it takes, it does take the full like hour and 15 minutes in order for the audience to give me permission to be my real self on a stage. Um, mm. So it's, that that's also part of the ritual, I think, or at least that's how I was thinking about it, is like just the mm. taking off of each of these clothes. Mm. Yeah, it's like taking off, taking off masks, um, which is sort of, yeah, it's kind of a subversion of what we would expect from a performance. Um, but yeah, now it's, now hearing you say that, that actually adds a really interesting perspective to it. Because I know, yeah, you did start out as this very, like, I guess a different character from how you ended it. Um, and it was just very, yeah, it's cool to hear that that was, that was so intentional. And I feel like, yeah, lyrically also, it almost felt like you were stripping away, like, place, time... Yeah. Then you were stripping away. You were stripping away linear time. You were like stripping it right down to like this weird, like cosmic um, energy by the end. So, yeah, that was very cool. Oh, <laughs> very cool to watch. It's awesome to hear you talk about it. I'm so glad that you got so much of that from it. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it, it's an intense experience. Like honestly, I watched it very, very late last night. I couldn't sleep. I was gonna, um, and oh, it was just like this really surreal, like. Um, experience that was just so yeah I feel like it's difficult to translate that type of experience into film so it's like I feel like it's easier when you're in the room in a theater but um yeah t like that whole thing about t turning the lights off having the candle um just like adds sort of this extra element yeah I'm curious like how you thought about the audience when you were doing this like do you, do you feel like you were kind of speaking to the audience um I do You're like in, them in my head I I went from because I'm used to performing the show to an audience of like a hundred and so that has a very specific feeling to it and I I, I I tried to be very aware of speaking to an audience of one in this instance and so a lot of the performances shifted wildly um yeah I had this very specific idea in my head of of one person of one faceless, nameless person who was a person I didn't know, <laughs> but maybe I knew of, um, who I kind of had to introduce myself to a little bit and gain some trust of. But but yeah, the specific idea of an audience of one. Yes. Because hmm. I was thinking, yeah, it's, it felt like as you were sort of connecting with these ghosts and connecting with these past histories, you were also doing a similar type of connective work to whoever was watching, like trying to bridge this huge divide um, in a lot of ways, like trying to speak directly to the audience um, and engage them and like acknowledge that this is a performance and people are registering it in their own particular way. So I thought that was a kind of cool parallel. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, it's just such a... Yeah, it's such an ambitious work. Um, I guess something else I wanted to ask was, uh, yeah, I know you're clearly inspired by like Christianity and uh, you know that tradition. But were there any other sort of like philosophies or like artists that you really drew from to write this? Oh man, <clears throat> it's been honestly, sure it's like been it, yeah, there's <laughs> a lot. <laughs> there was a lot, and it's been so long because I originally wrote it like five years ago. Um, God, who was I reading? I read, I mean, I was, I dipped a lot into the works of Hildegard Ben Bingen because I, um, I have migraines and sort of immediately after I have a migraine, um, a song comes like flying out of me. And so I was interested in mystics. I read a lot of, um, of mystics. The only one that I specifically remember using was Hildegard. Um, Lord, what else did I use? I'm like, well, I'm always, looking I back at my bookcase. Like, what when I get I asked that, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, I read a lot of like Oliver Sacks of like, how do you think mm -hmm. neurologically about your brain and like negotiations mm -hmm. and conversations with it? 
um, I read uh, I read some books by my great uncle Jay, who was a medium, and when he he talks about his experience of being a medium and what his experience of it was like. Um, but I didn't really use any of that. I mean, honestly, this piece wasn't written a lot with research. This piece was written a lot with like excavation of family histories. So I did a lot of like talking to my parents and like talking to my family um, about things that I maybe didn't remember or, um, you know, asking them more information about certain people that I maybe didn't know that well when I was a kid. Yeah, I mean, I definitely felt like there was, like, at some point I realized there was just a lot of, there are many layers um, to the, yeah, many frameworks that the show was using, um, as well as many histories. Uh, so, yeah, did you, so I guess you had to probably do a lot of research into your own family's past, and uh, though it sounds like you were already pretty familiar with it. Yeah. <laughs> as much as any of us are <laughs> with our own family's mm-hmm. histories. Uh, you know, you, there's a little bit of like Sherlock Holmesing that I feel like we all have to do with the things that nobody talks about. Yeah, how do you feel like? Um, and I'm sorry if this is too personal of a question, but uh, how do you feel like um, your, you know, the ghost that you did summon um, feel about the show, or how did like? Do you feel like they wanted you? They called you to do this? somehow no I don't feel like the ghosts called me to do this but they they have responded (laughs) some of them have responded um I in in different ways like my my godfather communication with my godfather has gotten a lot easier um I do feel like we did some we did some good work with his soul um during the course of the show um I had not specific I had not previously had a relationship with my great-grandmother Ella which now I have a rollicking relationship with her spirit um she's very vocal um to me in my life now which she was not previously um so I do feel like it sort of (laughs) cemented a relationship there um my uncle RL didn't give a crap um has never doesn't care about me who knows where he is um my piano teacher's pissed but that was the point um to, to ridicule her um, and to get us on, on eye level with each other after having been terrified of her for so long. Um, so now that's that's all fine. Um, yeah, and grandma's at peace. So, you know, grandma gra- grandma's just sort of like blanket proud and content. <laughs> um, and far away, far away, but present. Um, uh, not daily, not daily, but like monthly, monthly. I mean, I, every once in a while, I'll get like a feeling that somebody's, somebody's around, somebody's with me. Like my grandparents turn up when I talk about them. Um, uh, my granddaddy also turns up when my husband does something lovely. Um, which I think is cute. Um, but yeah, mostly I don't have a particularly active relationship with, with their spirits. And to be honest, like I'm kind of, uh, uncomfortable and unused to my gift with it. Um, I haven't totally figured out how to manage it. I don't know that I ever will. Um, so it's not something that I can just like drop of a hat, be like, and now (laughs) I'm going to talk to great grandmother. Uh, she just sort of turns up when she turns up, um, and I don't have any control over it. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I was going to ask, yeah, is there anything that you wish, um, people knew about ghosts or about like interacting and dealing with them? I feel like, um, there's not... You know, <laughs> there's many levels to that, I guess. But, yeah. Or anything that you wish you'd known. Hmm. I wish I had known that it's not that it's not necessary for me to be terrified. I wish somebody had t- honestly. I wish somebody had told me at a young age that I that this was something that happened to women in my family. Um, that this was not my imagination. That I wasn't crazy and that I wasn't sick. 
Um, I wish somebody had told me when I was a kid uh, that it was okay um, and that I could communicate and let them know where, you know, what I needed in order to still be healthy and communicate with them. Um, now I know how to draw those boundaries. Um, and I, I just wish I did earlier because I was a very scared little girl. And I think that, you know, I think back on her and, you know, my heart, my heart hurts for her. Mm. Yeah. I mean, so, so often that happens where like these wilder, um, things, whether they're, you know, I'm being a medium or whether, or extremely creative or even extremely emotional, um, yeah, those things, like, are just so feared. Um, yeah. But it's almost like they just want to be recognized in some ways. Thank you so much for listening. Again, you can watch Animal Wisdom by going to the American Conservatory Theater website, act-sf.org. Uh, click What's On, and Animal Wisdom is available to stream through June 27th, so don't miss out. It'll definitely give you a night to remember it might just change your life. Thanks for being here and see you next time.